What I've observed in the last two or three years is that we've really started to move towards a, a surprising consensus on many aspects of tax reform. And I'll, I'll just take one in particular to point out. And that is that three years ago, it was a, um, a big fight in the presidential campaign as to what kind of international tax regime we should have. Whether we should um, tax all foreign source income uh, and, and move closer to a worldwide taxation, which is what the president, uh, now President Obama, favored, or whether we should adopt a territorial tax system, which is um, what most of the OECD countries have, and let the country uh, where that income is earned tax it and leave it at that. Um, just in the last 10 days, the president uh, and his staff have announced that they have abandoned their push to move towards a worldwide tax system and would prefer to have some kind of territorial tax regime. I think a lot of people, both on the left and the right and the center, acknowledge that our tax code is too complex. They acknowledge that um, we need a tax code that conforms more towards uh, incentivizing economic growth. And given our, our current low tax revenue, now is a, as good a time as any to do this. But despite the fact that there is a consensus among people on the left and right in so many different areas, there's one issue, I think, that has defied the consensus, and that is, if we do simplify corporate tax reform, the corporate tax code, do we still need to have incentives for investment? And there's two very big um, provisions that encourage investment. One is the research and experimentation tax credit, and the other one is um, accelerated or bonus depreciation, bonus depreciation, whereby firms that make new investments can more rapidly write them off and take uh, off their taxes than um, what they might normally depreciate at. Um, one school of thought says we simply need to reduce corporate tax rates as low as we possibly can, and we need to get rid of all these incentives, all tax expenditures, to use the current parlance, and do whatever it takes to get down there without sacrificing too much revenue. And the other school of thought says it's really important that we encourage investment because investment is what creates productivity growth, and productivity growth is ultimately what helps to determine our standard of living. And that by getting rid of those incentives, we really lose uh, not just investment, but we lose future economic growth. And I think one thing the left and the right and the center could all agree upon um, is, is that we really do want to have a tax code that creates as much economic growth growth as possible, and we need economic growth as much as possible uh, right now. And so um, we've brought together three, uh, in my mind, three of uh, the most prominent um, experts on tax policy um, in the United States right now, um, and we assigned them each a, uh, a position that coincides with their actual position on this, on this issue. Um, Rob Atkinson is, of course, the president of the uh, Information Technology and Innovation Forum. Um, here in Washington, D.C., and he is going to argue that we need to include uh, tax incentives for um, investment. Uh, taking the opposite view is Michelle Hanlon. Michelle Hanlon is the chair of the Department of Accounting at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, I will also tell you one other important thing on her bio. She is from um, Eastern Illinois University, and she won an alumni award uh, at the same time that um, another famous EIU alum was given that award, Tony Romo. And uh, Tony Romo bravely accepted that award while having a broken rib. Amazing, amazing great man. I don't know if you knew, he had a broken rib in the game last night. It really wasn't touched upon in the media, uh, but great man. Um, and finally, um, um, to my left, and taking the position of uh, devil's advocate, is Donald Merritt. Donald Merritt is director of the Urban Institute and uh, the Tax Policy Center. and. Uh, has, uh, has had an August career here on the Hill, including being uh, director of the Joint Economic Committee. So our format will be, I'll give you guys uh, 10 minutes. I'm saying 10 minutes. After 12 minutes, I start to be a jerk, and I pull you aside. And then after everybody gives their spiel, we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Thanks again. Thank you, Michael. Thank I can't think of a more important topic in, in terms of determining what America's economic future is going to look like in Ten years than this question today that is in front of folks on the Hill and in the administration. So, we start. Maybe if I pointed 
statutory rates and numerous deductions and exclusions results in an inefficient tax system that distorts corporate behavior in multiple ways. Certain assets are, and investments are tax favored. Tax considerations drive over investment in these assets to the extent of more economically productive investments. So let me suggest that that statement is just simply uh, an opinion. Uh, it's value laden, it's un unobjective. Uh, it uses words like distortion, we hear loopholes. Uh, these are not objective statements that an economist would make. These are value-laden statements. And they're based upon, essentially, this view of what I would say the dominant neoclassical economic doctrine, which is that markets generally get it right. There are a few market failures, including spillovers and externalities. Uh, and that the lion's share of growth in an economy and prosperity comes from allocating in goods and services in a marketplace, as opposed to dynamic effects or innovation and as opposed to higher productivity and higher efficiency. So if you think about those two things as separate, you've got allocation efficiency and you've got productive efficiency. And as a result, there's this view that tax incentives distort allocative efficiency, and they do. The market would allocate things quite differently if the tax code did not do what it did. Now there's a reason though that it's that. So this view is that the most efficient tax code is the one where there are no incentives, no distortions. And this was really, people look at the 86 Act, the high water mark, we scrap a lot of those, and now they've seeped their way back in, and it's time to, it's time to get rid of them. Well, let me suggest there's a different way of looking at economics, what you could call innovation economics, what other people in the field call new growth theory or endogenous growth theory or structural evolutionary economics, whatever you want to call it. But it's basically an economics that looks more at putting growth not exogenous in the model, but endogenous to the model. And in that theory, uh, the goal of economic policy is to support the creation of new goods and services, i.e. innovation, and to boost productivity. Uh, market forces alone do not always lead to optimal outcomes. Now, I use the word not always. Sometimes they do. Oftentimes they do. But particularly with regard to innovation, market forces alone oftentimes do not lead to optimal outcomes. Uh, this is the head of the chief economist in the Canadian Treasury Department, uh, Lane Bob Iowa. Uh, and he has this great quote when he talks about the justification for the Canadian changes in their tax code in the last few years where they privileged investment in CapEx, in new machinery and equipment, and R&D. And he says there is no presumption that distortions are necessarily welfare reducing. Uh, distortions that favor contributions to long-run growth will be welfare enhancing. And another way to frame that is what uh, economists Phil Aguillon, Paul David, and Dominique Ferre have written, where they say, the empirical foundations for such sweeping statements as tax incentives distort economic activity are, quote, remarkably fragile. And I think that's right. I don't think there's a lot of evidence other than opinion behind these. So if you um, want to restate, go back to the Economic Recovery Board statement, I would say it's better for them to have said, and much more accurate, because certain assets and investments are tax favored, tax considerations induce investments in those assets, some of which replace less economically productive assets and some that come at the expense of more, depending upon the nature of the incentive. So in other words, I'm more than happy to acknowledge that there are some tax incentives that are put in the code simply because of special interest lobbying and have no public interest. But clearly there are other ones that could have a clear public interest and lead to higher productivity and more innovation than others. So what's the case? Let me suggest several cases, several points here. If you look at some of the key inputs of the U.S. economy, uh, what we see are tr very troubling trends. I think the case for tax incentives in the code are, number one, we're seeing very slow growths of CapEx. Uh, the U.S., for example, in this last decade saw the slowest growth in machinery and equipment in its manufacturing sector in any decade they've ever recorded, 6% growth. Every other decade has seen at least 25, 30, to 50% growth. So companies are not investing in new machinery and equipment at the rate they are. Uh, we see expenditures in workforce training in America, for example, are half of what they were a decade ago. Companies are spending or investing less than half on training their workers than they did a decade ago. And we see the corporate R&D rates are not growing in any significant way for the first time in American history. 
According to PEA, corporate R&D has grown three times faster overseas in the last decade than all R&D has grown domestically in the U.S. And lastly, uh, U.S. competitiveness has significantly fallen. Uh, I think we've seen that in some of the, in, 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 frankly, in the recent computers. You can see growth of CapEx, manufacturing in orange, overall economy in blue. You can see manufacturing CapEx has very strongly fallen. And even overall CapEx, machinery growth software has fallen as well. And, uh, U.S. Innovation and Competitiveness, a study we did called the Atlantic Century, where we benchmark the U.S. against 44, 43 other nations on innovation-based competitiveness, things like growth and productivity, growth of corporate R&D, amount of new business startups, growth of government R&D, things like that. And what we find on that is that the U.S. is 43rd out of 44 nations in the rate of progress. All these other nations are making bigger and better uses of innovation and technology than we are. And lastly, U.S. manufacturing job growth, the worst of any of the OECD nations that we found. Uh, so I think we've got big, big challenges in the U.S. economy and the tax code can play a key role. Uh, what are the cases for that, the other cases? I think one other case is that, that if designed right, the tax code can counter what I think is a very, very deep problem in the U.S. economy, and that's uh, chronic short-termism among many U.S. enterprises. This is a quote from the Business Roundtable. It is not some left-wing, uh, you know, rabble-rousing group that's attacking U.S. companies. The Business Roundtable, in a report recently by a group of CFOs, stated the obsession with short-term results by investors, asset management firms, and corporate managers collectively leads to the unintended consequence of destroying long-term value. And that really is what corporations are designed to do. They're designed to maximize shareholder value in the long run in terms of net present value. Increasing market efficiency and reducing investment returns and impeding efforts to strengthen corporate governance. When you go look at that report, what you'll find is many, many, in fact, the, the majority of CFOs will say they will cut R&D in order to meet quarterly earnings uh, requirements. Now, obviously, that's good for them in the short term, and I understand why it's rational for them as short-term actors, but it's not something that's good for the country and, and public policy should look against it. The other case for tax incentives is that our traded sector is very, very weak. We are seeing increased competition for sectors like automobiles, aviation, software, biotechnology, pharmaceuticals, some of the leading sectors in America. In fact, we now run largest trade deficit in high technology products we've ever run. And one of the reasons is because many other countries give big tax incentives that help their trade sectors. So we have a, 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 a provision in the tax code called the domestic production deduction, which lowers taxes on primarily sectors that are traded globally. 85% uh, 80, of those incentives go to manufacturing, uh, approximately. And so this, to me, is a good example of a tax provision that is helping to correct a problem. So what are some of the key incentives? Uh, I would say there's the R&D credit, accelerated depreciation, and expensing, and domestic production deduction. To me, you have to have three, two things that make an incentive worthy of consideration. One is there needs to be an externality. In other words, the, the returns that a company gets are not as high as the return society is. If there's no externality, then you don't need a tax incentive. And the evidence with regard, frankly, to all three of these is that there are big externalities. The R&D credit or R&D &E credit has been most widely studied, and economists suggest that the externalities are anywhere between two to four times. In other words, what a corporation, when they invest in research and development, they will get usually 25 to 50 percent of the benefits of that, and the rest of those benefits go to their competitors, to consumers, to others. So that's why we had the R&D &E tax credit put in place in 1981 in the Reagan administration for exactly that point. But the second point is you have to have an activity that's being undertaken that's sensitive to tax differences in tax rates. I frankly don't think hiring is all that uh, sensitive to tax rates. Well, that's obviously not the point of the debate here. That's a highly debatable point. But I do think that R&E uh, research and experimentation and CapEx is quite sensitive <coughs> to corporate taxes. Let me quote um, Michelle. If you haven't read Michelle's paper, and I'm not going to remember the title of it, but it's like a 150-page 
home that you have that's a very nice review of all the tax issues. It's on SSRN. Maybe you can cite it. Really encourage you to read it. It's written by Michelle and a couple of uh, colleagues. It's a very nice piece. It goes through all of the various issues. So let me quote from Michelle. I think this is your quote. If not, you can repudiate me. It says, corporate taxes can play a role in the manager's investment decision because the amounts, timing, and even uncertainty of tax payments and deductions affect the calculation of a project's net present value and hence the decision to invest. And I think that's very clear with regard to r and &E. And it's also now, I think, increasingly clear with regard to CapEx. There's a big debate about that. There are some folks who would argue that there are no externalities from CapEx. The company invests in the machine. They get all the benefits by a society privileging that investment. I won't cite the research here, but there's a report we wrote called Corporate Tax Reform in the Global Innovation Economy that goes through a lot of the new literature and economics of the last decade to argue that there are actually very significant externalities from CapEx. Uh, one of the studies is by Lauren Hitt, who's a professor at Penn. Lauren Hitt finds that when a company invests in a new computer, a new server, a new software, that they only, uh, that they only obtain half of the benefits, that half of those other benefits go to society as a whole. So I think there's a case to be made really on all of these that we need to maintain, and I would even argue expand these key incentives. So thank you very much. Today. I'm Michelle Hanlon. I'm a professor at MIT Small School of Management. Um, what I'd like to spend my time, my exactly 10 minutes uh, on today, is basically run through you know, the literature, in essence, about uh, investment incentives and talk about, you know, it, it turns out basically that, that the evidence, at least, you know, in theory, these incentives are supposed to um, provide more investment on the part of these, these companies. But it turns out the literature really can't document a very big effect. Uh, so what I'd like to talk about after I go through that literature is, you know, some reasons why we think it is that, you know, the responsiveness to these incentives is not as strong as one would think. Uh, and then go through, you know, the evidence with respect to at least one of these uh, reasons. Uh, and then I'll try to wrap up with a summary. Okay. So in aggregate, you know, basically the literature, what, what has been tested is aggregate uh, tests uh, for a long time. This is how they tested it, a time series test of aggregate investment to these incentives, you know, that government tries to give. Uh, and basically, they, they've had a lot of trouble trying to document any kind of association whatsoever. Uh, Jim Hines, uh, he has this quote, basically, the apparent inability of tax incentives to simulate aggregate investment spending is one of the major puzzles in the empirical investment literature. I mean, it is true in theory these things can, you know, provide incentives, but it just doesn't seem like we can document them. Uh, you know, and to be fair here, <laughs> empirically, this is very hard to document. We have this problem called endogeneity. Uh, basically, it's, it's when the incentives are given, they're given for a reason, and they're given because firms aren't investing. So you have this kind of problem trying to document this in the literature. Uh, so, so what has happened, you know, at least in terms of research, is, is recent work has tried to do different things. And I'll, I'll walk through one example here of how these investment incentives might work. And what they do, instead of looking at, you know, aggregate levels of investment for the whole economy, what they try to look at is, is cross-asset or cross-firm, cross-industry type of test. Okay, so, so one, in, one example would be when, when the recent bonus depreciation uh, incentives were given. Uh, it turns out, you know, there's a lot of studies on this. Of course, some event like that, it's a big, big incentive. Uh, but actually, the evidence is even quite scarce with respect to bonus depreciation as to whether this actually stimulated more investment. Uh, but again, you know, undocumented is a problem. The incentive was given for a reason. It's because we were in a recession, so it's hard to document. Uh, the most convincing evidence out there is this paper by Alison Shapiro. It's actually a great paper. Um, and what they do is they utilize the fact that this is a temporary tax incentive. And so uh, what they did is they, they look cross-asset, and they look at firm, you know, firms that what they try to do is look at asset investments, long-lived asset investments that qualified versus ones that didn't. And they look at the long-lived assets versus the, the shorter-lived assets. And, you know, when they look like this, you know, when they look do a test like this across assets, specific assets that qualified versus ones that didn't, they actually do find a response for qualifying assets. You know, in other words, you know, they get this bonus depreciation and it turns out more firms invested in qualifying assets. Uh, that, that type of investment increased. You know, but, but even this type of test cannot tell you about aggregate investment. 
what this what this paper documents it does document that taxes matter but it's just a shifting so firms that were going to invest in this type of equipment just you know crank their investment back into this time period so it just kind of stole from the future to make the investment in the current period and these these authors you know say that outright uh, the other thing that we don't know is how much of this is just shifting from one asset type of purchase to another, and whether, you know, how much is just relabeling this, you know, an accounting effect in, in essence. Uh, so, so, you know, I want to acknowledge they do document an effect here, the taxes matter, but it's just not the, the kind of effect you would expect. It's not this aggregate investment increase. It's, it's most likely just shifting for purchases into an early, earlier time period. You know, one of the confounding issues that you have when you, when you give this type of incentive is actually who gets the benefits. Um, and what has been tested in the literature, basically, is it, is it the purchaser, you know, the, the manufacturer that's, you know, giving incentives to produce more? Are they the ones that get the benefit, or is it the supplier of the, the equipment, actually? Uh, so it's true, you know, they, they give these incentives, the government gives these incentives. So it, let's say, for example, if the demand increases, under certain conditions, that could increase the price of the, the items that the manufacturer needs to buy, the equipment. And if it increases the price, basically that means the benefit goes to the supplier of the equipment, not the purchaser of the equipment, not the manufacturer. Uh, so, so you have this kind of compounding issue out there. A lot of the tests, you know, what we test is the dollar amount of investment, but that can be driven by quantity or price. The goal of the incentives is to increase the quantity. <laughs> But it could, in fact, be that the price just went up uh, in the economy. And as you might guess, you know, the literature has quite mixed evidence on this to some degree. But what, what, what it turns out is that it, it seems like it, it depends on, on how, you know, elastic that supply is of those equipment uh, that, that these uh, companies need to use to manufacture the output. Um, so, you know, this, this is uh, also present for R&D. And basically, one of the earliest studies on R&D basically showed a 30% implicit tax, meaning you know when these incentives are given, 30% of it goes to the supplier, uh, not to the not to the company that's investing in this new equipment. So you know why is responsiveness weak? You know we, the literature's had a really hard time documenting that these incentives actually work. Uh, so like we said, you know it could just be you know because we're in a recession already. You know the output demand actually drives it, not the tax incentives. Tax incentives just can't overcome uh, the bad economic times that, that are happening when these things are put in place. Uh, it could just be that we can't measure things very well. It could be the implicit tax effect. But, but let me give you another example. Uh, Tom Newbig has a paper. He's an economist. He's over at Ernst Young now. But he has this paper that he wrote. It's called Where's the Applause? <laughs> Which I love this title. Uh, but basically, you know, it, it turns out that there was an offer basically put in place to, for almost full expensing, essentially, at one point. And they proposed this to uh, companies. And what the companies, you know, did, he says, you know, we expected the standing ovation and these companies would be so happy about this, but it turns out, you know, there was no standing ovation. And uh, basically, it's a proverbial one hand clapping. But what the companies argued is they, they wanted a rate reduction. And so he goes through a lot of reasons why this might be. Uh, and one of them, is it, you know, he says it could be the accounting facts, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, it could be that much of this activity is already expensed. So we have a lot of intangibles based companies now, and they expense a lot of their uh, investment anyway through R&D, so we really don't need uh, full expensing of CapEx. Expensing policy would likely eliminate uh, interest deductibility. These are all kind of theories that he was putting forth. Uh, you know, and as, a society, as an aside, I'll get to the accounting in a second here, but as an aside, you know, it turns out that sometimes firms don't even use their the accelerated provisions offered to them. So in 1954, uh, accelerated appreciation was allowed. There were actually some subset of companies that didn't take it even though they could have. And even the bonus depreciation, there's evidence that some companies actually bought equipment that could have qualified, they just didn't take the bonus depreciation. So it, it's kind of these odd empirical findings that, that seem conflicting to, you know, why we give these incentives in the first place. But let me talk about the accounting effect. That's the thing probably I know the most about and probably the thing that needs the most explaining. Uh, so, so when Tom said that, basically what he's talking about is that, that firms value accounting earnings. And say, take for example these public firms, how responsive they're going to be to tax incentives. They have, they have to worry about two things. They have to worry about what they report to the IRS and then what they report uh, for financial accounting. Uh, so they need to trade these off sometimes. So we have a lot of evidence 
general evidence in the literature uh, that firms will pay taxes to report higher accounting earnings. Uh, we have evidence that companies that committed fraud were willing to pay taxes on those overstated earnings. Uh, we have evidence basically that countries will state actually that they move overseas and they retain cash overseas partly because of it helps their financial accounting earnings look better. Uh, it's not just the tax benefit, but the accounting benefit too. And we did a survey of tax executives and we just, we just outright asked them. We said, oh, at your company, uh, what metric does tax management value more? The gap tax expense, the effective tax rate, or the cash taxes you actually pay? And basically, 40% of the companies said that with a gap ETR was more important to their top management than the cash taxes they actually pay. And 36% said that uh, they're actually valued equally. So 76% of the companies, the, the tax expense of our accounting earnings is just as important or more important than the cash taxes the company actually pays. You know, this is quite surprising uh, to most, you know, finance and economics people. So what does this mean for investment? You know, what kind of evidence do we have? Or in concept, what does this mean? Well, you know, if you think about accelerated depreciation, that, that's accelerated depreciation for tax purposes. And that will save them, you know, will improve their cash flow because of the time value of money. But it does not reduce their income tax expense for financial accounting. That income tax expense is an accrual number, so they're going to have to accrue uh, those future taxes back to today anyway. So if you give accelerated depreciation, that does not increase accounting earnings. Okay, uh, so there's there's some evidence on this, and basically there's evidence. What they did is they compared as Jesse Egerton, and he's a, he's an economist actually, which turned out to be kind of funny side note on this. But he, he actually tests you know the investment tax credit versus accelerated depreciation. The investment tax credit uh, actually did it was a credit, so it actually increased accounting earnings. Uh, accelerated depreciation again doesn't increase accounting earnings. But what he finds is that the responsiveness. Uh, to these incentives is much higher for the, the investment tax credit. And you know, you can tell by the way he wrote the paper, he just doesn't believe this himself almost. You know, he, he goes through all these explanations at the end, he kind of throws up his hands, well, it must be the accounting. Uh, so, so anyway, I guess what I'm trying to say here is, you know, the, these accounting effects, they can mitigate, you know, how responsive these firms are, and it can mitigate the effectiveness of these, these tax incentives. And the companies, what they'll say they want, really, is a lower rate. Uh, you know, that, the other issue is, again, how complicated these, these types of incentives make our tax code. John Graham is a finance professor at Duke. He runs a CFO survey. He does it every quarter. And they just did one uh, this month. Actually, the results just came out. But one question he added to this survey this period is, he asked these uh, CFOs, would you be willing to give up all existing tax exemptions and credits in return for a reduction in the overall corporate tax rate, say, to 25%? And here's the responses that, that he got. 70% 70, 70 of the companies said yes. Uh, even though I'm not sure we'd come out ahead, I'd prefer a simpler system. 17% uh, said yes because our company would pay less in taxes. 13% said no. And you know, what is surprising about this to me is that um, you know, a lot of these companies are actually private companies. They're not very, very small private companies, but they're, they're private companies nonetheless. And still 70% say, you know, yeah, I'd rather have a lower rate than this accelerated depreciation or these other exemptions and credits. So, you know, complexity is another issue that uh, going with a lower rate over these incentives uh, would solve. So, in summary, um, you know, testing this association between tax incentives and investment is, is quite difficult. Uh, output demand will dominate. You know, if there's no demand for the product that you're producing, <laughs> no matter how many incentives the tax code gives you, it, it's not going to make sense to produce that product. Uh, so it's quite hard to test. Uh, implicit taxes and accounting effects can likely mitigate the effectiveness of these policies, you know. Uh, these firms aren't going to be resp as responsive as you might think because there's some implicit tax effect here and there the accounting effects. If it doesn't help them with their accounting earnings for public companies, a lot of times they won't engage in that behavior. Uh, the many incentives, you know, lead to a complicated tax system, you know, the perception of which is often unfair. Uh, the government, you know, people will say picks winners and losers through these things. Uh, the lower co corporate tax rate, uh, especially for publicly traded firms and even for large private firms, uh, would be simpler and promote more response. Uh, and also, if you went with a lower rate, the location of the investment would likely be affected as well and attract more business to the U.S.
pleasure to be here today. Thanks for coming out. Uh, I am boldly going PowerPointless, uh, so you don't have to look at me, but don't look at the screens. Um, first, so I've been re I've been rewriting my notes as the other two people have been speaking. So bear with me as I put them together. But first, I just wanted to quickly echo something that Michelle mentioned, which is is my experience as an economist. I've thought a lot about budget matters. I've thought a lot about a lot about accounting matters. Accounting really, really matters. Now, I'm enough of an economist at heart to think that the 76% of CEOs who said they were more worried about accounting measures than actual cash measures, I think all of them should be laid off, uh, since it's cash that ultimately matters. But my experience is that accounting really does matter, that you should think about it when you think about policies that affect business. And then in much of the rest of my life, I actually think about that in the context of the budget. And so you should take that insight that accounting matters, and you've probably experienced this, but it has enormous implications for how you think about federal budget issues as well. Uh, topic for a separate day. Uh, I think there's broad agreement. I'm, I'm supposed to sort of, you know, sum up here, uh, devil's advocate, so I will agree with both sides, disagree with both sides, and ramble uh, randomly here. Um, I think there's broad agreement that our corporate tax system has a lot of flaws. Uh, I was expecting one of the two presenters to show one of the classic charts that shows the corporate tax rate of the United States relative to other nations around the world, so I didn't bring it. But visualize, if you will, in your mind, a world in which most other developed nations have been lowering their corporate tax rate over time, but the United States hasn't. Uh, as a result, as we sit here today, the United States has effectively the second highest corporate tax rate in the developed world. It's about 30, 35% at the federal level, added in about another four percentage points uh, at the state level, and we're around 39 percentage points. Uh, Japan had been scheduled to go below us and make us the world leader of the highest corporate tax rate, uh, but after uh, the, the unfortunate uh, earthquake and tsunami, they decided to keep their current higher tax rate in place, so they're the only country that's higher than us. Uh, and so that's a notable factor. Now, another notable factor is that you should beware of anyone who goes around and only quotes the statutory tax rate for corporations. Because part of the gist of the conversation today is that there are a whole lot of other features of the tax code that matter for determining what the tax burden is on, on corporations. And so it turns out that while the U.S. has a very high statutory corporate tax rate, we also have lots of tax preferences. Right. If I were being political, I would call them loopholes or special interest provisions. Uh, if I were being in favor of them, I would describe them as you know, pro-growth things done through the tax code. Whatever it is, we do a lot of policy through the tax code. And so if you sum that all together with the higher tax rate, what you discover is that the effective corporate tax rate, take into account all you know, 10,000 pages of code or whatever it is, not just the one page that has the statutory rate on it, is you know, we are somewhere in the middle of our comparable. Right, depending how you slice the data precisely, we're a little above or a little below the median, but we're basically you know, within kind of a G7 uh, in the middle, possibly slightly on the high side. Uh, so keep that in mind, right? it's not just about rate, it's also about all these other provisions, many of which have something to do with investment. Um, now, I would argue, right, and this may show that you know, uh, I have served at agencies that have written things like what uh, Rob is criticizing, using the word distortion uh, willy-nilly, uh, but I would argue that uh, our current tax structure, when you take the rates and you combine it with investment incentives, does create some distortions in the following sense. Uh, CPO, uh, Congressional Budget Office, back in 2005, did what I thought was a great study. I quote it all the time. The numbers are a little out of date because the world has changed, but the basic principle still holds true. Uh, they did a study where they looked at the effective corporate tax rate and how it varied across different types of investments that businesses might make in the economy. And what they discovered is that the effective corporate tax rate on different kinds of investment varied dramatically. Right? So there are a whole bunch of things that are effectively taxed at zero, right? intangibles that people get to expense instantly. We leave that to aside. CEO focused on the things that are subject to depreciation rules or are treated as capital. And what they found was that at the low end, uh, investments in oil and natural gas activities had faced an effective tax rate of about 9%. Right, so statutory 35, but you take into account all the preferences, boom, 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 and the effective tax rate on those kinds of things was around 9. Uh, trucks, right, used in many lines of business. Trucks were taxed at about 18%. Software, right, software investments were taxed at about 29%, uh, and computers were taxed at about 37%. Actually, their treatment was so unfavorable that it ended up being higher than 35%. And I look at that as an economist and I say, wow, I bet a very large amount of that is distortion. Right, now that's a guess on my part. I agree with Rob entirely that there may, you may want some differentials in how different types of capital are treated if you feel like there are benefits to society that flow from that. But my guess is, and my prior is, that either inadvertently or because of good tax lobbyists, uh, that there are a lot of pure, straight-up distortions in the code. 
right? Investment in different areas is treated differently, uh, not necessarily with a good social cause behind it. And that there's a lot to be said for at least thinking about corporate tax reform as a process of moving back to a level playing field and then asking yourself the question, okay, in what case, what situations do I want to deviate? Uh, and I suspect that many of the deviations from the level playing field we have in the code at the moment wouldn't survive uh, such an examination. So, in part inspired by that line of reasoning, and I think in part inspired by uh, what Michelle mentioned, which is, uh, you know, I think a lot of corporations would like to see a lower corporate tax rate. My sense is that it's actually now a shared bipartisan agreement, in part because of uh, international concerns. There's a lot of interest in doing corporate tax reform that takes the form of broadening the base and lowering the rates. Right, so people aspire, if you look at like the Bull Simpson proposal, Bull Simpson had a proposal to bring the corporate tax rate down to 28% and then do a lot away with a lot of the tax preferences, right, including things like accelerated depreciation. And that is clearly, I think, the dominant strand at the moment as people think about doing tax reform. However, I did want to point out that there is another long history strand of doing corporate tax reform that takes a different approach that I think is more consistent with what Rob has in mind which is there's another view that says, wow, uh, the right thing to do with corporate investment if you want to encourage it uh, is to not discourage it through the tax code. And that the way to accomplish that is instead of having complicated depreciation rules and wondering about how accelerated they are relative to what would be fair under an income tax, why don't you just go for full expensing? Why don't you let companies expense their investment immediately when they make it? And it turns out, you know, we we'll run through the full models here, but there are good economic models that suggest that's the right tax treatment of investments so that you're not discouraging investments that then ultimately lead to growth. Uh, this is usually an argument, in my experience, that you hear from people on the right side of the political spectrum, right? So some of you may have encountered or may yourself make the argument uh, that one of the things we should do in tax reform is move towards full, full expensing of equipment. Uh, I should note, though, that it is by no means uniquely a right, 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 right side of the aisle uh, kind of argument. Uh, the Center on American Progress recently put out a paper uh, uh, written by Alan Auerbach, a very prominent uh, tax economist, uh, who argued for an approach that was based on this principle. Right, that if you want to treat investment fairly, one way to do it is just allow full expensing up front. Uh, we are, of course, at this weird moment in time where we are doing that for stimulus reasons at the moment, but arguing that we should do that on a permanent basis. Now, you know, I'm a many-handed economist, so I should just note that if anyone then comes to you and sells you that, right, there's something you should keep in mind, uh, which is there's also a nuance about how we uh, the tax treatment of debt. And it turns out that if you move to full expensing, but you continue to allow businesses to write off the interest they pay on the debt they borrow in order to finance their investment. You can actually end up in a situation where you're basically charging a negative tax rate to investment generally. And if you have a sufficiently leveraged project, it can actually be a quite negative tax rate. I'm not here arguing for that, so I'm here arguing, suggesting that, well, I know the dominant thread of tax reform is bring rates down, which has some significant benefits, right? Broaden the base. If you want to consider this alternative view, which is roughly, yeah, keep rates relatively high, right? maybe not 35, but bring it down to something that begins with a three, but then make investment incentives more aggressive, move towards full expensing, that one way you can broaden the base and help pay for such a move uh, is by reducing the favorable tax treatment of debt, right? and therefore not encourage as much debt accumulation on as leverage as we see in the system. A second item to note on that is, again, as Michelle pointed out very nicely, if you talk to business folks, in my experience, they mostly like the idea of corporate tax rates coming down, and they're willing to accept more favorable treatment of their investment, but they're not as excited, right? They're not out there applauding. Uh, and I would just note that one reason for that is that if you do investment incentives, the only thing you're rewarding people for doing is new stuff, if you design them right. Right, so if you made more favorable depreciation rules or expensing rules for new corporate investment, that would only apply to firms that go out and do new stuff. All the incentive is focused on the new. If instead your strategy of helping corporations, encouraging corporations to do stuff is to lower the corporate tax rate, right, you have the effect that you're also rewarding them for a whole bunch of things they did in the past, right, which from an economic incentive point of view isn't actually buying you anything. Right? The CEOs are happy because you're basically writing them a check on the past. Uh, one, one nice feature of focusing on new, on investment incentives, is you're only rewarding folks for, for doing things that are new. Uh, finally, just quickly on a point that I think Rob raised, which is, is an important one. Uh, basically, what I've just been running through is kind of the classic tax policy issue about how you want to design the tax treatment of investment. There's a long, uh, distinguished literature about income taxation versus consumption taxation. 
What I've basically just laid out is that there's an assumption tax argument for uh, allowing full expensing, not overdoing it, and favorable treatment of debt. That creates uh, broad-based uh, investment incentives. There's then the second question of, are there particular types of investments you want to create incentives for uh, because there are market failures out there and you want to encourage those? Right? And this is not so much an issue of tax policy per se, except administratively, that we do these things through tax policy. But you can imagine doing these things through the spending side, right? So you can imagine the Department of R&D writing R&D subsidy checks to encourage corporations to undertake it. Right? So this is basically an administrative issue that we choose to run those things through the tax code, not a fundamental tax issue. Uh, and in that case, I think Rob's right. You know, there's a strong argument to be made that if there's some activity that has a positive spillover on society, there's a good argument to be made for subsidizing that. The tax system is one way to do that. There are hard design questions about how you do that in a way that rewards precisely the activity you want to have happen. Right? If you create a research and experimentation tax credit, for example, you will discover that firms become very creative in figuring out what constitutes research and experimentation. Right? Just those of you who work in the healthcare field will know that if the federal government uh, helps pay Medicaid costs at the state level, states become very creative in defining what constitutes as Medicaid. So you have to think through what the implications of that are uh, to have an effective credit, but the principle of it, I think, is quite sound. Uh, and you should keep in mind, of course, that there are also situations where there are investments that create positive spillovers. There's also concerns about negative spillovers. Right? So I testified last week before a hearing on the House side about energy policy and taxes. And there the concern, a concern, was that uh, some energy investments, energy activities create pollution, uh, create reliance on, on imported oil, uh, and that therefore it makes sense for us to use uh, less of those things, right? Move to domestic fuel sources, move to less polluting fuel sources. The dominant tax strategy we use for addressing those things are narrowly targeted tax incentives for solar, for wind, for geothermal, or also a whole bunch of traditional fossil fuels. Uh, those can help address those negative externalities, but the one message I left the folks with over on the House side that you know fell like a lead balloon, but I'm an economist so I get to, to make these kinds of arguments, <laughs> is that if you want to use the tax system to influence investment because you're worried about negative externalities, negative spillovers from people's activity, the best way to do it is not to subsidize the green stuff, uh, but is actually to use the tax system to penalize the things you don't like. Right? And so maybe using tax incentives is going to be a second or third best way to get to address those issues. But really the best way to deal with those kinds of things is you know, to tax carbon emissions, tax gasoline use, those kinds of things, and then let the market do its uh, miraculous stuff. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Um, I thought it might be fair since Rob went first, and uh, we gave him two or three minutes just to respond to uh, Michelle or Donald, and then we'll open up for questions. Okay, well, first I want to thank Michelle um, and Donald for their excellent comments. Just a couple of things. One, a lot of that work, just because we can't measure it doesn't mean it's not true, and I think you make that point in the paper. This is complex stuff, and it's particularly difficult to do with bonus depreciation, which is I don't think really what I'm focusing on, I'm focusing on either expensing, permanent expensing, or an ITC investment tax credit. Uh, so I think just because we can't measure it, it doesn't mean the negative as well. Second point is we do have a, a long, long set of economic literature on the R&D credit, uh, which we review in a number of papers on our website, just look under the tax uh, link. And you'll see that virtually every single academic economist study from the last say, post-92 era, so that's 20 years, in this country and every other country, has shown that the R&D tax credit is an effective tool for spurring more R&D. Anywhere between at the low end, a dollar for a dollar, you give up a dollar in tax revenue, you get a dollar in corporate R&D expansion, or as high as $2.40. And the kind of consensus figure is around $1.40. So that's there. It's, it's, it's proven. It's shown that it does induce more. Um, I think with regard to um, uh, some of these points about, um, you know, the Tom Newbig study and, and all, I mean, I guess, first of all, I would say I'm more in favor of investment tax credit. Leaving that aside, um, I think one of the key points, and it really, to me, is a key point for any staffer in the room to consider is, what are we trying to do with tax policy? Are we trying to maximize worker book value, or are we trying to maximize economic activity in the United States? I think it's the latter. And I don't think corporate book value is exactly synonymous with economic benefits to the 
U.S. And particularly when we see, you know, many companies, and there's a new book, by the way, which really actually, well, you might, I don't know the author, but you might, it's called Saving Capitalism from Short-Termism. It's a Northwestern finance economist. You know, that's a great question. You should look it up. Check it out. This came out a couple weeks ago. And he makes this point. I mean, this is a, you know, he's like Michelle. He's like a, I don't know, I don't know a tax economist, accounting type, so he's not a radical. He makes this point that the incentives in many, many corporations now have evolved to keeping your stock price up in a, in a very short-term orientation, and that that is not maximizing long-term shareholder value. And so I think the notion somehow, just because companies think it's going to affect their book price, that's not really the right way to look at it. The real question is, does it affect overall investment that's going to lead to a higher GDP uh, and more innovation in the long run? And I think the evidence should, should be clear on that. Uh, the last point I'll just say is, is even when we see studies that, that show there's a clear benefit, and my favorite, and we, we got to this in a recent piece we wrote on corporate tax reform on incentives, is a study by Larry Summers and Alan Auerbach. We heard Donald refer to Alan Auerbach, both obviously very good economists. And they did a study back in 79, which you can get as an NPDR study, and they modeled an investment tax credit. What would happen if we had an investment tax credit on new machinery and equipment? And, and they said, okay, and they ran through this big DRI model. Here's what it was without it. Here's what it was. What they found was very interesting, that if you had an investment tax credit after some period of time, four years or five years, overall US GDP would be up, and investment in new machinery and equipment would be up. Okay, kind of logical. Uh, but housing starts would be down slightly, because what you see is you get demand for capital, therefore interest rates bid up a bit. Very small amount of adverse housing, but it helps with machinery and equipment. Now, after what we've gone through in the last eight years, and I have to say, we would have been a lot better off not taxing, not giving tax subsidies to housing, but giving tax subsidies to investment in real machinery and equipment. But here's what our Bach and Summers concluded after they finished their study. Investment tax credit leads to higher GDP, therefore we're against it. And we should not do it. The reason we should do it is because it distorted the market's natural allocation. Now, and to me, this is just ideology. You have a model, and it shows you get higher GDP. That's pretty much the only thing I care about. I just care about higher GDP. I don't care if it means that somebody else is distorted a little bit. And I think that's really what the end, at the end of the day, what we've got to keep the eye on. on our, you know, we've got to keep our eye on that ball, and what's the right tax ball to get to that, not about whether there's distortion, not about book value. So thank you. Thanks, Rob. Um, that's okay. I'm going to uh, take the uh, moderator's prerogative and just ask the first question. I'll, I'll, let me throw it up to everyone. Um, it was a fantastic article over the weekend in uh, the Saturday Wall Street Journal. It was an interview with uh, Robert Lucas. And, and Robert Lucas made the comment, he's made this in other places, that um, what the United States should really do is think about actually getting entirely away from all capital taxation. And in that context, he would say, I. He argues getting rid of the entire corporate tax rate, putting capital gains and dividends taxes down to zero. And he argues two things. He argues, first of all, that the corporate income tax is, is paid more by workers than anyone else. And in the long run, simply by depressing capital in, in investment, um, you end up with everybody hurting because you have a, a lower growth rate. Setting aside the feasibility of this, um, political feasibility short term. Should this be some kind of goal that we should be pursuing, or is this just simply unreal and we just need too much revenue and we always have to get it from the corporate sector? All right, I'll take first bite. The, um, my sense is that there's a fairly broad economic consensus that if you were starting a new nation today, right, so you're in Second Life, or you've set up your own floating island in the Pacific, or whatever it is, that the optimal tax system is a progressive consumption tax, right? Progressive because you want to accomplish progressivity goals in your design of a consumption tax, because if you design a consumption tax well, uh, it does not distort incentives to save and invest, which are the things, a key thing that leads in the long run to, to economic growth. When you have a, you know, we're not starting a new country, right? We have the 200 plus history uh, of the United States here to deal with. We have 100 plus years of experience with the tax code, or about 100 years. Uh, you know, it's hard to get from here to there. There are things you can do though, right? So like the Auerbach proposal for what you would do on the corporate tax is you would keep a corporate tax system, 
but you would restructure it in a way so it had full expensing, it had uh, got rid of the tax uh, favoritism towards debt, it did a few things on the international angle, and you would end up with something that functioned like a consumption tax, and so I think functioned like the way Bob Lucas would like it to, but continued to look like a corporate income, but you know, looked to the normal human beings like a corporate income tax, and would continue to raise some amount of revenue. And I think that's a plausible strategy to think through. Again, I haven't completely made up my mind on whether that's the right way to do it or whether we should do the base broadening lower the rate a lot. Uh, but I think it's, it's worth thinking through and it's something that would be consistent with what Lucas had in mind. So I guess a couple things. I mean, I, I think I, I agree with Donald, the political reality of doing there. I'm not even sure I would go there, but I do think he raises a couple of good points. One is, uh, I, I find it disturbing, or maybe troubling is a better word, that in the whole corporate tax debate, what we're talking about is revenue neutrality. We're talking about getting rid of these, these exemptions, deductions, credits, and putting them into a lower rate, but leaving the effective rate the same. And I think that's going to be a big mistake. We have to lower our effective rate if we're going to become more competitive. We have a high effective rate. Actually, now, a recent study I see we did an event, and I forget, I think it was on our panel. Um, yeah. No, no, the, the different one, DWC, I think. Pete Merrill, thank you. So Pete Merrill from, I think it's PwC, had a uh, recent, he, he's quoted four or five different studies that suggest you know, we're a little bit higher than that. We're, not, we're a little higher than that. We're, we're closer to the top quartile, I guess. So I, I do think we have problems there. So I would think one of the things we could do would be to lower the rate, but keep, in fact, keep and even expand some of these credits. So, and the second point I would make is I think it was a mistake, uh, I know there's obviously political, past political implications, I think it was a mistake to get rid of uh, that lower the dividends on the individual side. I think we should have done it on the corporate side. Um, there's a recent study by a finance professor, and I believe at NYU, and I can get it for folks if you want to see it. But he modeled and predicted that the result of that would be uh, basically more dividends flowing out of the firm and less being reinvested in the firm. And that's what we've seen over the last 30 years. We've seen the investment to dividend ratio go from around 65% down to about 25%. So in other words, capital that used to be retained within the corporation and then be reinvested to get future earnings, much of it now is flowing out, and in part is flowing out because dividend rates for the individual are quite low. So I think we would have been better off, keep the dividend rates the same for the individual, reduce them or even eliminate them in the, on the corporate side so you get the interest uh, and debt, uh, interest in, and, and equity being treated equally. So I think there are things we can begin to do that would go somewhat in Yeah, I just wanted to make one comment, really. I think one thing that I said that a lot of people don't realize that's very important is that corporations are just people. You know, the perception is we need to tax corporations, these evil corporations and things like this, but really it's just people. And, uh, you know, it has to be borne by the capital, the shareholders or labor, the workers, and the evidence, you know, does actually now lean toward that the corporate tax is borne by the workers. Uh, so if you reduce the corporate tax, you know, it's not, you know, some mythical being out there, it's, it's the laborers at that corporation that the tax break is, is being given to. Uh, so I think, you know, there's some merit to this to this idea in a sense, and, and Joel Slimrod's often said, you know, the corporate tax is voluntary now anyway, you know, corporations just pay it so they don't get in the front page of the Wall Street Journal like GE did. Uh, so, you know, there, there's some merit to this argument. It, it'd have to be worked out quite carefully, but, um, but you know, those are the arguments for it. Sorry, just to keep the round going here. This is there. What Michelle raises is an important point. Actually, Rob and Michelle together and is, is an interesting one for you guys to think through in the politics of this. Uh, there is a, an argument to be made, which Rob made, that it might make sense to actually, rather than do revenue neutrality on corporations, go for lower revenue. Uh, it is also the case that, as you may have noticed, the United States faces a relatively uh, dire-looking long-run fiscal outlook, which has convinced many people that uh, it's going to be necessary to actually find more revenue in the future. Uh, if you combine those th two things together, it looks like you may be on a trajectory where in the long run you want to simultaneously uh, reduce taxes paid by corporations if you adopt Rob's suggestion, uh, while raising taxes on individuals, right, if you adopt my view that in the future we're going to need more tax revenue than we've had in the past. Okay, that is the world's single worst bumper sticker, right, so cut taxes on corporations, raise taxes on people. <coughs> 
Uh, nonetheless, there may be a good economic rationale for it, right? Going through precisely the argument that Michelle laid out, which is that you know corporations are ultimately representatives of groups of people, right? There's a debate about how much of this capital, how much of this labor. Uh, I think the overwhelming amount of studies in the last few years have suggested that a substantial portion of the corporate income tax is actually borne by. Ten minutes or so for questions. I just ask that um, because our um, this room is so big, you just state it um, clearly and, and loudly, and also identify yourself. Yeah. Pete Davis, uh, economic consultant. Uh, anyone who's worked with the Ways and Means or Finance Committees knows that the tax code is a, a moving target. Um, even if you agree that the R&D uh, needs to be subsidized, if you turn it on and off 14 times since we created it in 1981, how can it have any beneficial effect? Well, I think, um, I think the... Um yeah, I'd encourage you to look at some of the literature review. The literature suggests that, that the temporariness on and off nature uh, has some detrimental effect, but it is not fully detrimental. There's still an incentive nature of the credit. It would be simply more effective if it were permanent. Uh, but the other key point there, which I'm glad you raised, because I didn't raise it in mine, is in 1992, uh, the U.S. had the most generous research and development tax credit or tax incentive system in the world. Uh, today, according to the OECD numbers, by the way, the new ones came out. I'll be happy to tell you why they're completely wrong, because uh, they, they're not based on what's called the B index. The B index is the right measure, which the OECD has done for many years. But the B index measures show that we're 17th now in the OECD. Um, so countries like China have a better uh, R&D credit than we do. Uh, the French credit is six times more generous than the American credit. Just think about that for a minute. You go and do R&D in France, you get a six times bigger benefit. The Canadians are about three and a half to four times more generous. The Mexicans have a better credit. Uh, so we've become essentially a very anemic tax incentive, and that's in part, I think, one of the reasons why we're seeing much more growth of corporate R&D offshore. So our view is you've got to make it permanent and you've got to make it bigger. Um, I agree, you know, I think that uncertainty is a huge problem. Uh, I think Austin Goldsby actually has a paper, and, and part of it he shows that the investment incentives have never stayed the same for more than four years at a time. I think it's a huge problem, uh, which a lower rate <laughs> kind of would fix. If you quit having these incentives, just put in a low rate, you know, and leave it alone. Um, these, these are indeed these countries that he's mentioning, you know, I think, you know, I don't really think of Mexico as the R&D capital of the world, uh, even though they have these big incentives. The other thing with R&D, you know, I think is, a, is an issue is if you think about R&D, the, the way we have our corporate tax structure set up, a lot of R&D does happen in America, um, possibly because of these incentives. But once that patent is close to generating revenue, that patent is often shipped off offshore. So much of the revenue from those patents is never taxed in America. So, you know, it is true that R&D might happen here, uh, and it might create jobs, uh, in a sense, you know, but but the revenue from that R&D creation often is not taxed back in America. So it, it's kind of a, a bigger issue. You got to think about international taxation and the intangible waste companies and things like this. But but back to your original thing, I think the uncertainty is a, a huge problem. If I could just just build on that and say that the, the uncertainty is now actually a fundamental feature of almost our entire tax code. Uh, you guys may have experienced this, but at the moment we now have significant temporary tax cuts in the individual income tax, which expire at the end of 2012, in the payroll tax, which is currently scheduled to expire at the end of this year, although there's a question mark about that, uh, in some corporate incentives that were designed as stimulus, like full expensing, uh, in a whole bunch of things, and I think this is a really what, this is a real telling piece of how Congress works. There are a whole bunch of provisions, including the R&E tax credit, that at the moment pretty much expire every year. They've been extended one year at a time. Now, one might call those the expirers, right? but they are not. They are called the extenders, right? because there is a presumption, I think, leading in that they're going to be extended. But I would say I'll call them the expirers. Uh, and they kind of accumulate over time. Right, so something else joins the club and then it gets extended a year at a time. We also have temporary tax cuts and estate tax, actually, so check off all the boxes. Uh, I think one of the important challenges for tax reform over the next year or two or three uh, is to figure out a way to go back to a tax code that's broadly more permanent. And then, you know, but to be fair to the challenges, you want a broadly more permanent code, but then you may want some sunsets for things so that Congress is forced to evaluate them. 
and finding a way to design sunsets, you know, like suppose you do the R&E tax credit for seven years at a shot, right, so that you force, Congress is forced to renew it or it expires, so they have to evaluate it, but it's there for a relatively persistent incentive. I, on a blackboard, there's a lot of logic to that, but then it's a little difficult to see how you prevent this accumulation of year by year uh, expirers, extenders in the future. Yes? Could you repeat the question? Yeah, could you repeat? I was, I was wondering if you could comment about the unseen cost of these programs. Uh, uh, the unseen cost of tax programs? Correct. <coughs> well, I don't know what's unseen about them. I mean, most of the, you go to joint tax or anything, you know, they'll tell you how much the R&D credit, you know, the R&D credit costs every year, and uh, pretty, pretty clear. And, so I think if that's what you're referring to, we do know that these are tax expenditures. There's uh, you know, there's absolutely no difference from a from a revenue perspective of cutting the rate, a, you know, a purple point or something like that. I'll give you a good example. The um, the uh, I think the president's uh, recovery board said if you eliminated the R&D credit, you could reduce the rate by one percentage point or something like that. So you know, if you reduce the rate one percentage point, we know exactly how much that's going to cost. If you have an R&D credit, we know exactly how much that's going to cost. So I don't, I'm not sure if these are unseen. Well, if I may offer a point of clarification, there's sure. a common argument. Uh, some people commonly argue that it steals money on the private sector, similar to crowding out. I'm not sure how to do that. It's, it's certainly, you know, I mean, the companies that are doing R&D are getting a benefit, and to the extent you have to have a higher rate, it's maybe meaning other sectors, other industries, or other firms that aren't doing as much R&D would pay more, sure. Uh, but to me, that's, you know, that's the idea somehow that the tax code has to treat everybody exactly the same, to me, is really more of an ideological statement than a factual statement. If a company is engaged in an activity that we know has big benefits to society, like investing in research or investing in new equipment, to me, and that's the that's part of the benefit we get. Yeah, if I could add on that, the uh, I mean the way I frame it up is to think about many of these incentives as being the moral equivalent of spending programs that just happen to be designed to be tax cuts, but that functionally in their economic budget and distributional implications, they really are the moral equivalent of spending programs. And I don't mean that I mean, in some circles spending is a pejorative. I don't mean that as a pejorative. I just mean that as a descriptive. And it's kind of along the Robs is just saying, these spending programs run through the tax code should face the same cost-benefit type analysis of any other spending program. And yes, spending programs mean that somewhere someone isn't getting that money instead. But, you know, we decided that in many cases that makes sense. And so you've got to do that analysis. And then I will agree with you, though, that they are, they do, are hidden. Right? I think one of the reasons it's popular to do spending programs through the tax code is that elites know it's there, but it's much harder in normal discourse to know they're there. Right? If you want to find the list of tax expenditures, you can't find them in the main budget document. You've got to go to you know, the analytic perspectives, page 483. Right? So I know where that is, but you guys may know that where that is, but it's not as commonly you know, out there and talked about as the top line spending numbers. We have time for uh, maybe one or two quick questions. Yes. Hi, Matt Torcher with Representative Nan Hayworth's office. I just uh, one one thing that you didn't really touch on all that much was the uh, corporate capital gains rate. Um, it, my understanding is it, 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 corporate capital gains are taxed at the same corporate income tax rate that uh, uh, that corporate corporations would pay on anything else. Um, a couple of years back, they or the, a number of proposals came out to reduce the corporate capital gains rate. Um, I guess if my recollection is correct, I think it had been done in Germany. Had a lot of positive spillover effects in, in reducing uh, corporate structures, reducing the number of subsidiaries, and the like. Um, if you could talk about any of the benefits, perhaps to doing a, a, you know, if you're talking about investment incentives, whether that would have positive spillover effects for reducing the corporate capital gains rate as well. Um, I guess you know I haven't really thought about that a whole lot. I think it's just been <laughs> uh, they've had the same rate all along. I mean. It, I guess you'd have to take, make these same arguments that it would create some incentive to have these firms invest. Um, yeah, I, I guess I don't, I don't really uh, 
have any data or analysis to, that would say what, whether they, you know, what that would do exactly. You know, when I was at the Illinois Treasury, we did the 2007 Treasury report on corporate tax reform. Uh, we looked at it, and that was uh, one of the three proposals we came up with was was, was reducing that. But uh, it's one of those things that uh, it's pretty arcane. There were two or three people at Treasury who were really, really adamant about doing it, and the rest of us didn't really understand it, didn't really care a whole lot. So, um, you know, it's one of those things, like, if, if it's really difficult to explain to to an economist, it's even more difficult to explain to a member of Congress and that, to motivate them on that. I think it's, it's an unfortunate reality. Pete, do you want to say it, it tends to be very concentrated in certain industries, like timber, real estate. I mean, one thing I guess I would note is, you know, a lot of the corporate tax shelters from the 90s had to do with coming up with paper um, losses to offset corporate capital gains. So, I mean, it, there is some idea that this is significant for these firms, but, but I just don't have a sense of what dropping that rate would do uh, in the long run. Uh, David Payton, I represent companies in aerospace and heavy equipment. Ernst & Young came out with a new document last week in the Arnie Tax Credit. Uh, if anyone in the panel has seen it, would you care to uh, address what it adds to the discussion? And conversely, does it have any weaknesses? I was gone all last week. I haven't seen it, so maybe you could send it to me, David. Okay. Four for four, no. All right, so we have time for one more quick question. I'm oh, sorry, Satara Sammy from Pharma. Um, can any of you touch on patent boxes as a way to uh, incentivize um, innovation, but then also capture some of the lost revenue from that's generated from patents that go abroad? That's a segue. Uh, were you planted here by somebody? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for bringing that up. We actually have a, a report we're releasing on patent boxes, and it'll be next year. <laughs> I know, that's what I said. It's a beautiful <laughs> sentence. Uh, ITIF commercial. I think it's next Tuesday, next Tuesday, 9 o'clock, our place, uh, be on the web. Anyway, for those of you who don't know what patent box regime is, is a number of countries, particularly in Europe in the last four or five years, have adopted this regime, and essentially what it does is it Reduces corporate income on revenue, reduces corporate taxes on revenue from patents, patented products. And some are even broader. We have a, a person from the Netherlands who's at the event. They have actually the broadest definition. They call it an innovation box. Uh, but Sweden, Switzerland, Belgium, France, uh, Holland, uh, China, Ireland, and, and the UK is considering a couple others. Um, but anyway, short story, bottom line, one of the big problems with it in Europe is that you cannot tie the receipt of the patent box incentive to the, either the, 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 either the uh, investment in R&D in your country or the production of the product in your country it, it, for, because of these bizarre, I shouldn't say that, these strange EU rules they have, uh, which I think are mistaken. Our view is we should have something like that in the U.S., but tie the recipient, tie, tie the re receipt of the incentive to the actual production of the product or the R&D or both here in the country. But it does seem to have a big impact on patents. Uh, as you would expect, com companies are patenting more in these countries and partly to shift income in these countries. Uh, but I think it's an interesting proposal, one certainly worth uh, that we should all look at care very carefully. I just want to thank uh, everybody for coming. In particular, I want to thank uh, ITIF and the Tax Policy Center for uh, hosting this with American Action Forum. Thank you, everybody.